Okay, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this day as we study your word. May we be attentive to what you tell us. May we understand what you desire from us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, chapter 6. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Charge Aaron and his son, saying, This is the teaching of the burnt offering. It is the very burnt offering over offering over its flame on the altar all night till morning and the fire of the altar shall keep burning on in it and the priest shall wear his linen garb and linen breeches he shall wear on his body and he shall take away the ashes that the fire consumes from the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar he shall take off his clothes and wear other clothes and take out the ashes beyond the camp to the clean place and the fire on the altar shall keep burning on it it shall not go out the priest shall burn wood on it morning after morning and lay out on it the burnt offering and turn the fat parts of the communion offering to smoke a perpetual fire shall keep burning on the altar. It shall not go out. This is the teaching of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron are to bring it forward before the Lord in front of the altar. And a handful of it shall be removed from the simula of the grain offering and from its oil with all the frankincense that is on the green offering, and it shall be turned to smoke at the altar. A fragrant odor is token to the Lord, and what is left of it Aaron and his sons shall eat as flat cakes. It shall be eaten in a holy place in the court of the tent of meeting. They shall eat it. It shall not be baked, not be baked leaven. As their share, I have given it from my fire offering. It is holy, it is holy of holies, like the offense offering and like the guilt offering. Every male among the sons of Aaron shall eat it, a perpetual portion for your generations from the fire offering of the Lord. <coughs> Whatever touches them shall become holy. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering Aaron and his sons, which they shall bring forward to the Lord on the day he is anointed, a tenth of an Ephraim of Simola, Simolia, as a perpetual grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it in the evening. On a, a griddle in oil it shall be, be done, soaked, through you shall bring it as a grain offering of big pieces. You can bring it forward, a fragrant order to the Lord. And the anointed priest successor among his sons shall do a, a perpetual portion for the Lord. It shall be entirely turned to smoke, and every priest's grain offering shall be in, entire. It shall not be eaten. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, This is the teaching of the offering, offense offering. In the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered, the offense offering shall be slaughtered before the Lord. It is holy of holies. The priest performing it as an offer, offense offering shall eat it in a holy place. It shall be eaten in the courts of the tent of meeting. Whatever touches its flesh shall become holy. And when some of its blood is splattered on the garment, 
that which has been splattered shall be laundered in a holy place. And an earthen vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken. And if it was boiled in a copper vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed with water. Every male among the priests shall eat it. It is holy of, of holies, and every offense offering from which blood is brought into the tent of meeting, atone in the uh, sacrum, shall not be eaten. In a fire it shall be burned. Okay, footnote for verse 2. Uh, buddy, you want to take that? Sure. So I guess we'll find this out, but are they making a kind of cake or bread here in the, in the last part that was happening? Uh, the part that they were eating, I, I thought that was... Uh, the grain that uh, they're cooking? And semolina is something. I'm not much of a farmer, although I was employed as a farm laborer in Israel. I should know this, but is anybody a baker? What's semolina? That is something. It is. It's, uh, a, it's a very... Mm -hmm fine flour in fact it's what they make pizza out of good pizza okay I, yeah yeah i knew it was something okay yeah so they, they so they make this fine flour and i guess sir i guess we'll find out in the footnotes but it sounds like they're making some kind of cake or flatbread <laughs> maybe something like pizza right yeah they said they used <laughs> um, riddles so i assume well were they were okay. they where they slaughtered the animal, they're, they're having a barbecue, obviously. <laughs> Might be a pancake rather than a pizza. Maybe matzo, yeah, some... ma beginning of matzos. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, a good good approximation. Probably matzo, exactly. That would be matzo, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the teach. Pardon me? Go ahead. Okay. This is the teaching. Leviticus repeatedly introduces a particular set of uh, regulations with the phrase, this is the teaching Torah. This being the first um, occurrence. Teaching is in fact the primary meaning of Torah and the translation preserved uh, that sense uh, throughout, uh, throughout in, con in context, procedure, ritual regulation, and similar terms used in sundry modern English. I actually, until it was primarily law, but anyway. In any case, the reiteration of the term is a strong um, verbal symptom of how Leviticus differs formally from other biblical books. Uh, this is uh, uh, primarily a book of instruction and one of Hebrew names, uh, Torah Komanim, uh, it is the, the it is the very burnt offering. Uh, the semantic uh, force of the Hebrew phrase "ki karula" is uh, to emphasize the noun "ola" that follows the indicative pronoun "ki." Uh, flame. Uh, the literal sense of place of burning, though the translation "hearth." proposed by some modern scholars sounds altogether too domestic for a cultic setting. Uh, stylistically, the entire passage about the blood offering is dominated by terms related to burning, as if to focus the idea of a sacred fire uh, that burns perpetually, coordinated with the sacrificial fire uh, that entirely consumes the burnt offering. Uh, the word for burnt offering, or holocaust, or la, is not derived from a root that means to burn, but rather uh, from the verb to go up, which however uh, metonymically uh, linked to burning by suggesting the idea that the whole sacrifice uh, goes up in smoke. Uh, fire and blood are the two uh, uh, subprominence um, preeminence, are the two Oh, wait, we got lost here. Um, are the two substances that are uh, key to the sacrificial rites. Uh, but the preserved present passage gives preeminence to the 
uh, nexus between cult and fire, the element associated with God's fiery epiphany of Sinai and with the uh, first appearance to Moses in the burning bush. Hence an altar with a fire that shall not go out. Um, Aaron, uh, Aaron and his son shall eat. It must be kept in mind that in this agrarian society, the landless members of the tribe of Levi needed the cult for the needed the cult for the bread and butter, or more literally, the bread and meat of their physical sustenance. Uh, the the throughout the sacrificial regulations, uh, provisions are made. Uh, for setting uh, aside portions to be consumed by the priests. It is holy, in, it is holy of holies. As elsewhere, this structure uh, is, is a way of indicating a superlative in biblical, uh, in biblical idiom, the sense being uh, supremely holy uh, sacrament, sacrosanct. Whatever touches them shall become holy. It is also to uh, construe this sentence as Baruch Le Le Levin, Levin does, uh, to mean whoever touches them shall be holy, i.e. no person is allowed to touch them, touch the flat cakes made from the grain offerings who is not holy or a member of the priestly caste. Uh, Jacob uh, Milgram, uh, however, make, makes a, a persuasive case on philological and other grounds uh, that the reference uh, is to objects rather than to persons. What is involved in uh, is an uh, idea some scholars have described as contagion of holiness, uh, symmetrical with the, the more a uh, common idea of a contagion of impurity. Objects that come in contact with con consecrated substances, such as grain offerings themselves, become consecrated and are no longer to be used for profane purposes. 15, a uh, successor among his sons. The literal sense of the Hebrew is in his stead among his sons. But in his stead is regularly used in reference to monarchy to indicate the successor to the throne. And that must be the meaning here. Uh, perpetual uh, portion for the Lord. Although uh, the use of, of, the, uh, of the noun uh, portion may be a linguistic uh, fossil hearkening, uh, harking back to pre-monotheistic era when the sacrifice was conceived as a way of offer, offering food to the gods. Uh, its introduction here is more probably dictated uh, by the desire to use a, a complementary term. Uh, one part of the grain offering was reserved for the priest to be in, eaten in their portion. And so the remaining uh, part uh, burned on the altar is described as a, a perpetual portion, portion for the Lord. Um, every priest's grain offering shall be eaten. It shall, it shall, shall be entire. That is when a priest presents a grain offering on his own behalf rather than behalf of a lay person, no part is to be reserved uh, for his consumption. All of it must be burned on the altar. Okay. All right. A um, couple of things that, that I take away from what, what they're saying there. Um, an offering to the Lord, uh, sacrifice to the Lord, um, touching it makes it holy, kind of a, well, it's, we, we should... It, it certainly moves into the area of uh, sacredness when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Um, yes. And so that's that's part of that and why it's important that the person 
have examined themselves before taking it and realize what they're receiving, that uh, that's an interesting way that it's presented. You remember when the 70 elders of Israel went up and they had uh, uh, a barbecue, basically, uh, and dinner with the Lord, a fellowship with him, and they described, instead of describing God, they described the ground and on which he was, where, where he was, that it was like an emerald. Um, but that, that fellowship with God is, uh, is tied in with the eating of the sacrifice, uh, the, the blood that sprinkled on the people, uh, before they went up that was uh, was also put on the altar which was part of the sacrifice that was put out there for the 12 bulls that uh, were sacrificed and it, the blood actually attaches the sacrifice and the people together if you would uh, one of the reason for the, the sprinkling of the blood on the people is to tie them to the sacrifice This, this whole um, sacrificial system really pointing to Christ being the one who ties us to fellowship with God. And uh, that the sacredness of that, we talk about Holy of Holies, the, the, the really uh, most I'm looking for a word here. Um, well, most special, um, you know, rather than common, which is the other other exception. You know, the things we use for normal. Um, I'd never thought about eating bread with frankincense in it. I have no idea how that would taste. But uh, do you think that all these uh, these rules and regulations that the uh, priestly ca uh, class was subject to today is the common people were they concerned? Were they aware of them, or were they just remember what a priest does? The priest priest represents. The people to God and God to the people. Okay. Um, you see that in uh, our liturgical, if we're not hindered by the by Zoom and the like, you see that in a liturgical stance of the, the pastor uh, facing the altar when he's speaking for the people and facing the people when he's speaking for God. Um that uh, I, it's it's more than it's more than symbolism. Uh, in that the words that are being spoken are words of of gospel. Uh, they are words that that work faith because they're God's words, not the individual's words. He is being used as a tool. So, you know, that's in the, the and why we do liturgical worship. Um, but, but, but did it mean anything to the common people who just want to? Well, I think it certainly did. And I think, uh, you know, when I think about the frankincense and the like being in the, the sacrifice, you know, it's not just the smoke that goes up that's pleasing to God, but the people also can smell and determine that, you know, that that's taking place. Um, so it's interesting how the senses are used for us to understand and to you know, acknowledge the presence of God. Probably one of the reasons why incense is used in high liturgical worship.
I thought it interesting with the, I don't remember what, as far as if, if the clay jars came in contact with, they had to break them or something, but with the copper ones, they had to wash them and scour them out. Uh, you know, you know, they'd run out of clay jars eventually, wouldn't they? <laughs> well, no, you you make more clay is is available. <laughs> out Maybe in the that's desert, right. they, if you think about it, them, I guess they could. <laughs> yeah, think about it. Um, even today, uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Jew has one set of uh, of pans for uh, working meats and like, and another for uh, for milk and cheese and that kind of thing, those products. Um, and if, you know, if you didn't do this, you certainly would stand a chance of, uh, of passing on to the, the group, the second, third, or fourth, or fifth, sixth, tenth, hundredth time you use that that jar, um, something contaminated in it, um, where that's not quite so true as far as a porous surface is concerned for the the metal. So, um, without trying to explain bacteria and you know that type of thing. To them, God has given them instructions how to take care of that group while they're in the desert. So, uh, buddy, you got anything to add? Ritual can be carried to an extreme, that so much so that separates the uh, clergy from the people. I mean, was that one of the complaints of Luther? Okay, I got to turn my hearing up just a little here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I missed what you said. I'm saying, but, but ritual can be carried to a point where it, it, there's a barrier between the priestly class and the people. Well, that was one of the complaints of Luther, wasn't it? Well, now you're you're talking the Catholic Church and you're talking about yeah. things that were... <clears throat> and, and even the uh, rabbinical class during the yeah. time of Christ. Okay, here, when you get into that, away from Old Testament, all the way to, to where we're at, um, you're, you're talking about a group uh, that have substituted tradition for scripture, and it's the traditions that are being taught more than anything else. And, you know, some of those, the traditions just totally takes away the meaning of, and what God has told us. Uh, you know, indulgences and uh, work righteousness and all this other stuff that was introduced. And not that it's, when it was first introduced, not that it was introduced in a, um, with the intent of doing something wrong or benefiting from it. Um, you know, it, it first starts out penance and assigning penance uh, because you've been sinning and you need to do something to show that you're sincere about it. And then the, it got carried away, and uh, afterwards people saw it as a, a way to um, do things like finance crusades, um, uh, build churches and the like, um, in, enhance their own uh, economic status. Those, those, uh, that certainly goes a long ways away from what its intent initially was. Um, but that's what we do as sinful human beings. When we substitute our ideas for what the scripture says, then we get there. Uh, and we, we really go against what God wanted for us in the first place, what has instructed us and the like. That's why it's so important to say with the scripture. And, uh, you know, the... 
the early church fathers, they knew their Old Testament very well. And they could take the Old Testament and they would say that, you know, the scripture they had had to be also interpreted according to the rule of faith. But then they allowed themselves at the same time um, the ability to, to reach into to different areas and to interpret uh, the, the scriptures in ways which most of us would never have thought about doing. Um, it, it jumps way, quite a bit away from typology. Um, some of it was, well, it was interesting and, and it certainly pulled a lot of uh, attention to the point that they were trying to make. Uh, but at some times it would remove maybe some of the intent of the passage itself. So the, the, the best way for scripture to interpret scripture is to stay with what's there. Um, yes, typology works. Typology is certainly in the, the way in which the, the Holy Spirit has worked to enrich the scriptures. The scriptures are not like other books. They just aren't. Um, and so you find a harmony there that, uh, and um, a subtle writing into the later text, what was before, to emphasize what's going on. So, traditions are fine, maybe, okay? Depends on how they've been developed. But we need really to stay with the point of what the scripture actually says. All right, are we ready to go on? Yes. Okay. Uh, Susan, you want to take that? Sure, chapter seven. And this is the teaching of the guilt offering. It is holy of holies. In the place where they slaughter the burnt offering, they shall slaughter the guilt offering, and its blood shall be cast on the altar all around. And all of its fat shall be brought forward, the broad tail and the fat covering the innards and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, which is over the loins and the lobe of the liver, together with the kidneys it shall be removed. And the priest shall turn them to smoke on the altar, a fire offering to the Lord. It is a guilt offering. Any male among the priests may eat it. In a holy place it shall be eaten. It is holy of holies. The offense offering, like the sin offering, a single teaching do they have. The priest who atones through it he, his shall it be. And the priest bringing forward a man's burnt offering, the height of the burnt offering that the priest brought forward is the priest, his it shall be. And every grain offering that is baked in an oven and everything made in a pan and on a griddle is the priest who brings it forward, his it shall be. And every grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall be for all the sons of Aaron, each man of them alike. And this is the teaching of the communion sacrifice that is brought forward to the Lord. If in thanksgiving he brings it forward, he shall bring forward with the thanksgiving sacrifice flat cakes mixed in oil and flat cake wafers coated with oil and cakes of seminola soaked through mixed in oil. The cakes of leavened bread he shall bring forward his offering and his thanksgiving communion sacrifice. And he shall bring forward from it one kind each offering a levy to the Lord for the priest casting the blood of the communion sacrifice, his it shall be. 
and the flesh of his thanksgiving communion sacrifice shall be eaten on the day of its offering. He shall not leave any of it till the morning. And if his offering is a voltive or free will offering, on the day he brings forward his sacrifice, it shall be eaten. And on the morrow, what is left of it may be eaten. And what is left of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt in fire. And if some of the flesh of his communion sacrifice should be eat, indeed be eaten on the third day, it will not be acceptable. He who brings it forth, it will not be reckoned for him. It is desecrated meat, and the person eating of it bear his guilt. And the flesh that touches anything unclean shall not be eaten. In the fire it shall be burned. And other flesh, whoever is clean, may eat the flesh. And the person who eats flesh from the communion sacrifice, which is the Lord's, and his uncleanliness is upon it, that person shall be cut off from his kin. And should a person touch anything unclean through human uncleanliness or an unclean beast or an unclean abominable creature and eat of the flesh of the communion sacrifice which is the lord's that person shall be cut off from his kin and the lord spoke to moses saying speak to the israelites saying no fat of ox or sheep or goat shall you eat and the fat of a beast that has died and the fat of a beast torn by predators may be used for any task, but it shall by no means be eaten. For whoever eats fat from the animal from which fire from which fire offering is brought forward to the Lord, the person eating shall be cut off from his clan. And no blood shall you consume in your dwelling places, whether from fowl or beast. Any person who consumes any blood shall be cut off from his kin. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites, saying, He who brings forward his communion sacrifice to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from the communion sacrifice. His own hand shall bring the fire offering of the Lord. The fat together with the beast he shall bring it. The beast to elevate as an elevation offering before the Lord. And the priest shall turn the beast into smoke on the altar. And the beast shall be Aaron's and his sons. And the right thigh you shall give as a levy to the priest from, from the communion sacrifice. He of the sons of Aaron who brings forward the blood of the communion sacrifice and the fat his shall be the right thigh for a share. For the beast of the elevation offering and the thigh of the levy I have taken from the Israelites, from their communion sacrifices, and have given them to Aaron, the priest, and to his sons as a perpetual portion from the Israelites. This is the allotment of Aaron and the allotment of his sons from the fire offering of the Lord, from the day they were brought forward to the, be priests to the Lord, which the Lord charged them to give from the day they were anointed from the Israelites, a perpetual statute, statute for their generations. This is the teaching for the burnt offering. For the grain offering and for the offense offering and for the guilt offering and for for the installation offering and for the communion sacrifice which the Lord charged Moses on Mount Sinai mm -hmm. on the day he charged the Israelites to bring forward their sacrifices to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. Okay. Well, buddy, do you want to take the footnotes? For chapter 7? Yes. 
Um, gosh, wait a minute. Am I right here? Chapter 7, right? Yeah, it starts with 18. Yeah, it's footnote okay. 18. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay. Um, desecrated meat. The Hebrew um, pigul is a rare term uh, of uncertain etymology and without evident uh, cognates in other Semitic languages. Most interpreters, ancient and modern, assume it means something like abomination or abhorrent thing. Uh, but Jacob uh, Milgram, um, carefully scrutinizing the other um, uh, bi uh, biblical uh, occurrences with an eye to the, 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 the present context, um, persuasively argues that the word uh, has the technical sense of dese desecrated meat uh, and other flesh. The Hebrew says somewhat obscurely, only the flesh. The context compels one to infer that what is meant is the flesh of the communion sacrifice or that uh, that has not been defiled by contact with something unclean. Uh, 21, any unclean abominable creature. The Hebrew noun is um, shekets, which usually means abomination. Some manuscripts reason read uh, sheretz, creeping thing, uh, which would be the more expected term here. The term in kosher, you know, protocol is that I knew was teref. Something like teref is a kind of non-kosher food, but I guess this sheketz actually refers to the actual animal rather than the animal product. Well, and I think you're not, yeah, I think you're talking. The pig as opposed to the bacon. Abominable food, right? abominable animal yeah i mean there, there there's certain foods that you know that are not kosher of course yes. and uh we have uh what peter's famous uh um uh, uh you know uh, epiphany and what acts three where he sees that you know snakes and reptiles can be eaten and so forth and uh in kind of kosher protocol uh stuff like that would be called tariff but tariff would actually be I think the food products more like um, bacon as opposed to a pig, right? So, okay. I guess the other the other this other word refers to the actual animal or creature. Um, uh, the uh, um, a beast that has died. This is a single word in the Hebrew. Um, the the uh, basic meaning is a carcass, but with the ne necessary implication. Uh, it, it, that the animal has died from natural causes rather than uh, violence. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, beast torn by predators. Again, this is the word in the Hebrew. Oh, here we go. Terapha. Okay, that's the word I was familiar with. Okay. Which means something uh, a torn. Uh, the taboo in eating torn carcass uh, was felt so strongly that much later in Yiddish usage, the word would be adopted as a general term for forbidden food. Okay, that's where I got that from. It eventually yep. evolved into Yiddish and popular Hebrew. Okay, um, as all your, in, in all your dwelling places, the introduction of the term is an indication uh, that the ban on ingesting blood uh, is in no way restricted uh, to animals or even um, categories of animals sacrificed in the cult, but is comprehensively uh, binding on the Israelites wherever they dwell uh, to elevate. The gesture was a public sign of conveying the part of the animal elevated to the Lord's introduction uh, or possession. Uh, 24, uh, the breast and the thigh the same two portions of the animal are received uh, for the uh, Aranides for the for the Aranides in the installation sac. Why well, isn't Aranides? I don't know. In the installation sacrifice, uh, about which uh, instructions are given in Exodus uh, twenty-nine, it is a, a token of uh, 
uh, of how keenly the, the concrete details of these seemingly dry cultic passages were reflected on by later generations that Moses um, should, um, sh should wittily invoke uh, these body parts in a neurotic poem, transposing them from animal to woman and uh, uh, proclaiming that he will take his zoo portion as did the priests of old. The ingestion uh, illusion uh, registers a sound exegetical understanding that the breast and the thigh are the choice parts. Uh, 35, from the day they were brought forward, as elsewhere, the singular uh, masculine verb literally, he brought them forward, is the equivalent of a passive form. Uh, the term he uh, brought forward is equally used for sundry sacrifices and for the priests. Um, in cultic context, it has a sense of presenting or bringing forward into the sacred zone of the sanctuary, into the Lord's presence before the Lord. Its cognate uh, accusative is Corban. Uh, and, of course, we know that from the Synoptic Gospels, the general term for offering. Thus, the priests are dedicated to God, brought forward into the divine presence, just as the sacrifices are dedicated. Okay, it's interesting. You caught the, the Corbett, uh, where Jesus gets on them about their laws concerning that. Right. Well, it came up in the last chapter as well, um, and it came, well, I can't remember what the word was, but uh, it was it was something, uh, Ole Corbin, and uh, it, 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 the, the translation was, or the, off, the footnote was saying the translation was something like uh, um, uh, consecrated offering, and uh, it caught my attention because in Hebrew, you know, asking like how much something is in a store is kama zeole. And kama is just one of those words like how much or, you know, whatever, one of those kind of placeholder things. How much, how far, you know, whatever. And uh, um, ze is just a placeholder for it. And ole, I always thought was related also to, to how much. But, you know, when I looked at it and looked at, back at it through the dictionary, it actually refers to an offering. So Kamaze Olay, the contemporary Hebrew for how much does something cost in you know, Tel Aviv or whatever is, uh, what is it offered for is really the literal translation because yeah. it comes from offering. All right, so later in the Old Testament, you read about uh, the offerings that were brought uh, that uh, the animals brought and sacrificed in the, in the temple were uh, unworthy animals. And uh, part of the uh, part of the anger of, of the Lord breaking out on the people and the destruction of Jerusalem was because of their worship practices. They did not stick with his word. So here in Leviticus, uh, we were we're seeing this now. It, would, uh, it certainly is clear that uh, there are specific directions as to what is to be offered and when it is to be offered and how it is to be offered. And uh, also the not only how to do it, but also how not to do it. Uh, it reminds me of uh, Luther's Catechism and the Commandments. Um, if, what does this mean? You'll be told what you're not supposed to do and what you're, you are supposed to do. Uh, both sides of the coin. Do, uh, do Orthodox Jews today, are they allowed to receive blood transfusions? Or is that considered ingesting blood? Gee, I don't know, Robert. I, I have no idea. I, I would assume that they are allowed to take blood transfusions because oh. they're their men alive was especially in battle and that type of thing. So, 
Um, I know you always... There's also a refusal of many Orthodox not to be part of the military, so I, I guess I have to say I really don't know. What do you know, buddy? Well, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> that's a good point, Robert. What I understand is that it, it was or had been a, a point of controversy, but uh, I, don't, I don't know of a lot of Orthodox Jews who would, you know, not seek medical help. Um, well, I mean, I know Jehovah's Witnesses. Right, Jewish right. Jewish. But th there's, a, there's actually, uh, uh, just down the street from where you'll be worshiping next week, uh, about 18th South and uh, 11th East, there's that big Chabad uh, center. You've probably seen it. It's a little, it looks like a little shopping complex. And it's actually owned and operated by um, um, Orthodox Jews of the Shabbat movement. And, you know, they observe the, you know, the hairstyles, the long sideburns and the, 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 you know, broad brimmed hats and so forth. And there's a kosher food truck outside. And I, I mean, the, the, I mean, the the, the, the well, it, it's, it's like Hasidism. It was a movement. It uh, it kind of, I, I think it really caught hold in New York City among American Jews. Well, that and, was a common it, sight back east, but I haven't seen right, it out here. Right. They're, they're, they're fellow travelers. They're uh, they're kind of in the same same vein. And uh, But Shabbat, I think, was kind of a revival movement to uh, get Jews to sort of return to that uh, more traditional style. And the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the rabbi's name is Zippel or Zipper. And uh, he, he turns up in the newspaper a lot yeah, for this or yeah, that. I've know. heard of him, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he, you know, he, 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 I, I've tried posed questions to him, but he doesn't take me very seriously, I don't think. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> I think he might take Pastor Malone more seriously, <laughs> and he'd be a good person to ask about some of this stuff. <laughs> He's almost within walking distance of the uh, of the uh, you know the new St. John's co uh, campus there on Eleventh East. Okay, <laughs> is that on the uh, west side of the road or e east side? Yeah, yeah, it is. It looks like a little sort of shopping center, and uh, it's. Uh, Kind of just just north of the Sugar House Post Office, and just south of where that Brownie Bakery used to be, kind of in there, approximately eighteen hundred South Eleventh East. And I, I've always meant to eat at the kosher food truck there, but the food's pretty expensive. Um, but uh, they they have uh, you know kind of some shops and things in there that cater to Orthodox Jews. They also hold their services in there. But it, it's a it's a different congregation from Kolomi. Kolomi, uh, I think, uh, will, will serve Orthodox Jews, but it's primarily made up of conservative and Reformed Jews. The the uh, congregation up on Twenty Third East, and I've been up there a number of times for, you know, to attend services for Jewish friends. But I've, I've never, other than a couple of conversations with Rabbi Zipper, I've never had much contact with that place on Eleventh East. Good. I haven't been that way for a long time. I, I go up. Yeah, I, I think seven, I'm about seventeenth quite often. And I go by Eleventh East, but when you're when you're heading towards Twenty First South, it, it, you say, "Do I really want to go that direction?" <laughs> yeah, when you head towards Twenty First South on Eleventh East, and it's hard to get past Twenty First South now because of the construction. Right. Uh, it's on. It's on. It's on the right side of the road. There it looks kind of like a little shopping center or strip mall. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I picture I think it, it pretty much. Right, but there, there are all these kind of kosher businesses in there, and they also hold um, uh, worship services. And then the the rabbi zipper, who you know Robert's familiar with, I, I became aware of him through the news and because through Jewish friends. And I understand his son is is now an ordained rabbi. So. They have two rabbis over there, and yeah, they're kind of they're kind of uh, orthodox of that kind of Hasidic vein. And uh, when I looked up the Chabad movement, it was you know kind of uh, a way to move Jews kind of back to their orthodox roots. 
because to be honest with you, I can, I can, I'm, I'm not being a Jew, of course, it's, you know, neither here nor there to me, but, um, you know, my experience with Jews, with, um, with communities of reformed and, uh, Reformed and conservative Jews has been they're 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 highly highly secularized and really tend to be agnostic, right? And that was my impression of living in Israel. That was that by and large Israel I thought of as a very secularized country, with the exception of the Muslims, the Christians, and the Orthodox Jews. But the day to day Israelis were I found to be fairly secularized. Well, it, it has to do with the entire uh, enlightenment, if you would. We're at the end of the human enlightenment, and because of human enlightenment, we're also at the uh, the the point of their that uh, God is dead, at least dead in their minds and hearts, um, and that uh, there are no absolutes. That's kind of worse well, than it is today. Yeah. That's the- yeah, and I'm not sure how that affected Judaism, but I think when Jews started to whittle away at their traditions and they kind of whittle away at their practices, that, you know, by and by they didn't have much left, right? And um, so, you know, it just kind of, you know, became, you know, uh, less vibrant than it had been. But yeah, actually, while we're on this topic, there was something that Robert said earlier, if I could, you know, just kind of hold forth that kind of caught my attention. First of all, I noticed in, in when we talk about these uh, Jewish services that really there are a lot of uh, parallels with uh, Eastern Orthodox Eucharistic practices, right? There's, there's a way, I'm not a priest, I'm not a clergyman, but there's a way in which the, well, actually, I'm a minor clergyman. I was ordained a reader. But uh, the, uh, there's a way in which the, uh, the Eucharist is prepared that's very precise. And uh, a way that the, the uh, kind of overflow of the Eucharist is treated, which is very precise, which parallels a lot that was, of what was said in the last chapter about these, these uh, temple practices in ancient Judaism. And then uh, the way in which there, there are items or food items in the Orthodox faith that are blessed by a priest. For example, bread that's given away to people that don't take communion or to outsiders. Um, grain that's blessed uh, in memorial services. And of course, Easter eggs. Uh, at Pascha, the red eggs are blessed by the priest. And that, I assume that's where the custom of the colored Easter eggs comes from. But uh, uh, I, I notice, you know, Sunday school children and outsiders are always cautioned not to take something that's blessed if they're not going to eat it or use it. In other words, it's considered really bad form to throw away an Easter egg that's been blessed by the priest or a piece of bread or some grapes that have been blessed by the priest because the priest has asked for uh, the descent of the Holy Spirit on these items. So if you're not going to respect them, you know, don't bother is kind of the, the standard in the Orthodox uh, Church. And then when, when um, uh, what really piqued my interest more that, that Robert had to say, and Robert comes up with some great observations, is that uh, I think in Luther's time, you know, things have changed. Because in Luther's time, uh, the Catholic and Orthodox churches were, for example, were very powerful institutions that had a lot of control over stuff. And what I see, particularly in Orthodox churches today, is that the um, there's a danger in that the priest serves a very large congregation, and the churches are not so powerful as they used to be. And uh, the priest is one person serving, I mean, in the, Greek, in the Greek and Russian churches, hundreds, maybe thousands of people. So the priest is not really that powerful in in terms of church government and what i see happening you know more, you know unfortunately quite a bit is the priest ends up kind of an employee of the of the parish council and i see that in protestant churches too where the the pastor is kind of hired by the church and if the church council doesn't like the pastor 
you know, he's out. And unfortunately, I've seen the same thing happen in Orthodox churches. So um, it's interesting, Robert, I think how that's kind of turned around sort of since Luther's day, where the churches were these very powerful institutions that were kind of governing what people said and did. So I guess it's the problem is to find a balance, but that's easier said than done. It well, might. I think one thing that happened is the number of people, the number of men, for example, and women in the Protestant churches that have women pastors has really shrunk. There's not really a lot of people available who want to be clergy. And uh, I think that that uh, that affects the, the makeup of the church and kind of the way things shake out in terms of uh, worship in America anyway. Um, but anyway, just kind of an observation that I had. Okay, uh, in that observation, you should look and see what where Europe where Europe is is where America normally is about twenty to thirty years later. Yeah, yeah, Europe's been more secularized than we are. That's that's all part of this um, infiltration of uh, secularization and humanization, um, and the effect in the educational system of the young as we go along. Um, this is the world in which we live in at this point. And, uh, well, what's disturbing to me is about the, the system overall, we have to keep in mind because this is a society that we live and try to evangelize. Uh, and well, and the, 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 the centers of Christianity now, and there's a book in your library at the church there, that uh, I had checked out of the library. It's, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, the gist of the book, and, and it, it's written about 20 years ago, is that uh, you know, centers of Christianity today are not in Europe or North America. They're in Africa, Asia, Latin America. You know. Yeah, that's because that's societal secularization is at a different state in time in those areas, as I see it right now. It's kind of the life, the cycle of the church, much much like the cycle of what took place in the Old Testament with the Jewish nation. They would go from freedom to captivity. They'd go from worshiping God and, and uh, uh, being aware of a relationship with him to caring nothing for the relationship, not thinking about it at all, and, and doing that which is natural for a sinful man to do, and uh, then having to be brought up short by God, uh, saying, okay, you're going to go into captivity, and then he bringing them back out of captivity and going through the cycle again. And I don't think it's much different. I think we're very much uh, in the same cycle that uh, we were at Christ's time now. Um, but the crest, you know, the, one of the things is the, the blood of the martyrs is what sowed the seeds of the church. And there was a realism and understanding that, uh, that God not only is real, but that he, his absolutes are still absolute. Uh, there's very few people that believe that now, truly. I mean, it'll be shown by their life. And you're seeing the, the latest papal decrees and the like from the um, Pope indicate yeah. oh. uh, that we should be more accepting to the changing in society. And, uh, yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was going to mention. So that's, that's what you're seeing. That's part of the, the sinful world we live in, and it's one we have to ask us. Okay, yeah, he, ju he just smacked down the uh, conservative American Catholics. Yeah. And, you know, all the stuff that's been happening in nature, um, I, I, I agree with them that it, 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 uh, it's man that's uh, responsible for 
the turbulence right now, but I don't know if I'm going to blame it on global warming. I'm going to blame, blame <laughs> on our inability to see that God requires our absolutes and that uh, he's trying to get your attention. But, uh, you know, instead of focusing on global warming, it might be better for us to focus on what does God really want me of me? What does he want? And he wants a relationship. He wants you to listen to him. He wants you to accept his forgiveness and live as, as he has ordained there initially for you to live. Loving him and loving your neighbors yourself. So, no, that's what I see for society and for us uh, right now. And with that, we're out of time. So let's close with prayer, okay? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this day and time to be in your word. We ask that your spirit would lead us to make our commitment to you and our worship of you acceptable in your sight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.